So, hello guys, my name is Alexey Grishenko, I'm working at Pivotal, and today I will tell you about Apache Spark architecture, what it is, how it works, and what is inside. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. I'm an enterprise architect working at Pivotal, I'm delivering different data processing systems all across the EMEA. I'm working with different data processing systems with, for seven years or five years. I'm working with MPP, Hadoop, I'm Apache Spark contributor, and I'm blogging about different aspects of Spark architecture and in general distributed systems architecture. Okay, what I will tell you today is motivation behind Spark. So why Spark was invented after all and what was the motivation to create this engine. Next is Spark pillars. What are the main abstractions that you work with when you are working with Spark applications? Then I will tell you about Spark architecture. How it works, what is inside, how the data is being processed, and what, what are the steps, what are the parameters, and so on. Then, one of the main problems of Spark is Spark Shuffle, how shuffle happens between the executors, and uh, how you can work with it. Then, data frame, what is a data frame, why it is important, and how you can make your work more efficient and more, more stable and easier for business users to understand and to operate with this. Okay, let's start with the Spark motivation. As you know, the difficulty of programming directly in MapReduce is one of the main drivers. Uh, please raise your hand, anyone who has written Java MapReduce. Yeah. So many of you have done it and you understand that it's a complex problem and sometimes it's a bit difficult because if you have a complex uh, processing of your data it's not enough to write a single MapReduce. You write enough one MapReduce, second MapReduce, third MapReduce, you exec you're executing a pipeline of these MapReduces one after another to achieve a specific uh, requirement. For instance you can have one MapReduce to sort your data but if you want to sort your data or to join the data with another one and then sort it you have to run two MapReduces and you have to write this code. Next is uh, performance bottlenecks, or not all the use cases can be covered with batch processing. Spark allows you to have not only batch processing, but micro batches, which is very, very, very close to the streaming. And next one is uh, iterative uh, jobs. They're typical for machine learning. For instance, uh, you got a big data mart, and you want to make a number of passes through the data mart to process your data. In a traditional system like uh, MapReduce, you just read the data, make a first iteration, put some results to the hard disk drive. Again, read the same data, make iteration, put it to hard disk drive. It's usually very complex and uh, it's not very efficient. For instance, for many algorithms, Spark compares with uh, Mahout and tells that it gives you 100 times speed up for specific workloads just because it's, it is able to efficiently cache the intermediate data. Okay, here is an example of uh, difficulty of programming in uh, MapReduce. On the right hand side, you can see the code of a typical word count. It has implementation of the mapper, it has implementation of the reducer and the main task. It, it's not the final implementation, it doesn't implement configurable and so on, so it's even not final. And here is how it will look like in uh, Spark. Here I use PySpark just because I like it the most. In general, it's one line, but you can li write it in a number of lines if you, if you like. Okay, next is about performance bottlenecks. If you got uh, typical MapReduce jobs, how many times your data will be put to the hard disk drives when you are processing this? So, does anyone of you know the answer? How many times? Okay, so in general it's three or more. In some rare cases it might be two if all your data for a single reducer will fit into the memory of this reducer. Then it will be only two. But fitting into the memory of the reducer is not really the case for most of the jobs you are executing. So three or more. Then consider Hive as a main SQL tool. How do you think how many times you will scan your data? So you got some data and you're executing, your business users are executing a query with join into tables and applying window function on top of this join. So how many times you will scan your data? It's a complex question. Typical Hive query is translated to three to five MapReduce. 
course, there are some queries that can be executed with one, and there are some queries that cannot be executed with five and require more of them. Then each MapReduce will scan the data at least three times, and uh, each put to the hardest drives mean that you write the data to the hardest drive, and then you read the data. It's two scans of the data. So in general, it uh, turns out into 18 to 30 scans of the data where you are processing a single query. It's I would not say that it's not efficient, it's just awful, but uh, Hive uh, has a good... Uh, Hive has good performance because of the tests, because of Hive on Spark and different uh, optimizations. So this is the worst case when you use Hive on top of MapReduce, you don't optimize anything, you don't use HDFS cache and so on. But, okay, so what Spark offers you? First of all, it's lazy computations. It means that you're query is really not executed unless you got all the information you need. You got transformations and actions, you transform the data, and only when you call an action that triggers the computation, Spark starts to execute it. When Spark starts execution, it tries to understand how, is, how it can do this in the best way, how it can optimize, how it can reorder the joints and so on. And only after this, it can execute it. Second is in-memory data caching. So, you don't need to scan hard disk drive all the time. Spark has a number of options for caching. And the last one is efficient pipelining. So it tries to avoid putting data to the hard disk drives as much as it can, because usually in Hadoop cluster, hard disk drive resources are the bottleneck. So if you will take a look at the profiling of your Hadoop cluster, most likely you are limited by the performance of your file system on the data nodes. Okay main Spark concepts and Spark pillars, as I call them. Spark has two main abstractions for implementing the data processing. First of them is resilient distributed data set, and the second one is direct acyclic graph. What is RDD? The simple way of thinking about RDD, you can think that it is just your data set split it into the parts, and each part resides somewhere on the working nodes. So it is the simplest thing to do. And this is usually how business users, if you get them access or analysts, think about this. But if you are a programmer, if you need to debug the job, if you need to understand what's really ha what really happens and why you get this out of memory, for example, you need to get deeper. So complex view, and they said that RDD is really an interface. So RDD does not store any data itself. It stores only meta information. All the data is stored by the Spark engine. It's something like Block Manager. RDD refers to the data stored in other external system in Spark cache or in another RDD. So RDD is just an interface. It does not have any, any data in it. So partitions are computed on failure or cache eviction. So it is fault tolerant. And metadata that it stores is first partitions. But it does not store data for partitions. It stores references to the partitions. So it can be a reference to a specific input split residing in HDFS. It can be a reference to a specific cache item. Next is dependencies. It shows how this, if this RDD is not RDD directly reading data from some of the external system, then it stores information about dependencies. So this RDD depends on this one and this one. And it's not really on RDD level, it's stored for each of the partitions. This partition depends on this one and this one and this one. For instance, if you implement a union. Next is compute. What should be done to recompute this specific partition if it is evicted, if, it, if something has failed or so on. So this is very important information and dependency is one of the most important uh, problems in Spark. Imagine that you got a shuffle. So you are shuffling the data across the cluster. All of your partitions are split into parts by hash of some field and loaded into different partitions. Each of the target partitions will have a dependency on all the source partitions. It means that if you have to recompute a single partition after the shuffle, you have to re-execute the whole shuffle. It is the only option. Next is preferred locations. If your partition refers to some data, 
uh, installed an external system, it knows that the best way to execute this extraction of the data is to execute it locally for the data that when it resides. For instance, Spark reuses all the Hadoop input formats. So you can use the same text input format, sequence file input format, and so on. And these input formats returns you the information about input splits. Input splits contains information where the data is really stored in HDFS, and Spark can reuse this information to schedule this partition to be on a specific uh, machine. And the last one is uh, partitioner. So how the data is partitioned. Partitioner is similar to MapReduce Partitioner, so it's just something like a function that used to split your data across the cluster. But default partitioner is hash partitioner on top of some field. It takes binary uh, representation of the field and uh, calculate hash value for this and uh, evenly split it by the number of target partitions. Okay, RDD is the main and the only manipulation tool in Spark to process your data. So if you got your data, you load it into Spark, you, should, you surely will load it into RDD. RDD is the most basic concept, and if you got a data frame, data frame inside it has RDD. If you got a graph and you're using graphics inside of it, you will have an RDD. So RDD is the main, main thing in Spark. And you got two classes of operations transformations and actions. All the transformations are a lazy computation. So you are executing transformation, it creates another an RDD that depends on the previous one. You execute another transformation, it creates another RDD that depends on the previous one. Creation of the RDD is just a modification of the metadata. Nothing is really executed. It's just this cycle. You can create an RDD that depends on two RDDs. For instance, join, union, intersection, and so on. This way you will have dependency on two of them, but again you will just create another RDD with dependencies. And only when you execute an action, then Spark starts to really execute your job. It starts with the last RDD, gets back to, to fetch all the dependencies, and when it got them, it starts to, pro to find a way to optimize your processing and then to execute it. And the last conception is a direct acyclic graph. Direct acyclic graph is basically the graph of execution. Node of the graph is RDD partition. So each RDD is, you can think of this as your data set. Each data set is split into a number of parts. Each part is called partition. First, when you load the data, for instance, if you get text input format, you load it with a text file. Then, uh, each partition will represent a single input split into that, that is returned by text input format. If you got uh, zip files, then single file will be a single partition. But for most of the cases, you will get a single partition mapped to a single HDFS block, approximately. H is a transformation on top of the data. As I told you, you get a number of RDDs created from one another, and when you execute actions, Spark starts to bring an execution graph, and each edge is a transformation that is really executed. It is a cyclic. It means that each of the partitions can have, is not mutable. Spark is completely written in scale, Scala. In Scala, most of the objects are immutable. So this concept is transferred directly to Apache Spark. So if you have a partition, you cannot update the partition. You're creating another RDD that updates the data stating in this partition. But previous RDD is immutable and its partitions are immutable. If you can, if you can, if you want, you can access the previous RDD and recompute it. So the graph is cyclic. And it is direct because each transformation is transferred data from one partition to another partition. You cannot just go back. Here is an example. It's a very simple example. First, we get a text file. It reads something from an external system using text input formats. In the end, you can specify amount of partitions. Here, I specified four partitions. Then, we get a flat map. Flat map means that you are mapping input values, and for each input value, you can output one or more uh, values as an output. Who of you know, if you get text input format in MapReduce, which will be the key and value for the mapper. Key is a byte offset and value is a line 
delimited by the new line character in the file. So that's right. We, so this function, this lambda function, will get each line one by one, and then it will split it. Text file in uh, Spark doesn't return you byte offset because mostly it's not important. You can use uh, um, you can use Hadoop RDD. You can specify text input format, and then it will return you key value pairs. But by default, text file returns you just lines of the text from the file. So you split it by the new line characters, by the space characters, and top characters. And for each line, you output each word separately. Then you map each word with word and one. Then you reduce by key. It means that you get word as a key and one as a value. You execute reduce by key and reduce function is just a sum. So that's it. Then for each of the values, you execute print function. And print function just prints the output. Here is how direct acyclic graph will look like. First of all, you get HDFS, you get all the input splits generated by HDFS. You execute a text file, it returns you an RDD. RDD has one partition for each of the input splits. Then you execute flat map, it gives you another RDD. Execute map, gives you another RDD. Each partition is transitioned to one partition. But then you execute reduce by key, and reduce by key forces the shuffle. And here is where the shuffle happens. Each of the partitions of target RDD depends on all the partitions of the source RDD. If this single partition will disappear, or it will be put in cache and will be evicted, then Spark will try to recompute it. Trying to recompute it, it will go to all of these partitions. If none of them is cached, it will go back. None of them is cached, go back and read the data from HDFS. So it might happen that if you lose a single copy from the cache, you will go back to HDFS and reread all the data to regenerate this one. And in the end, you execute an action for each, and again it maps one to one. Now we will tell you how it really works and what is inside. First of all, we got two types of nodes, driver node and the worker node. On the driver node, we run an application usually called driver. On worker node, we run a number of executors. When you run Spark on a cluster, you can run it in many different ways. First is Spark standalone. With Spark standalone, you don't need anything except by Spark. It will be completely managed by Spark itself. It's very useful for cloud deployments, like imagine you can, you can initialize Spark on something like AWS, and you won't need to install HDFS, install Hadoop, install anything. You just run Spark on the cluster, and it runs, and it is ready to process your data. You can read the data from S3 storage, process it, and write it back to S3. This is, this is a trick. You don't need anything. You don't need anything from Hadoop. If you want, you can run Spark under Yarn. This way, Yarn will manage to bring up all of these containers for executors and for the driver itself. It depends on the mode. And the last one, oh, the last option is to run it under masses. Again, if you like masses, then you can run it this way. Driver has a Spark context that is created. Each of the worker nodes has a cache. By default, driver doesn't store any data. It's used just to manipulate the data process and generate the execution graphs and so on. But if you run Spark in a local mode, in a local mode you can have a driver and executor in the same JVM. But again, uh, you never run local mode when you got a cluster. And then each worker node, each executor, has a number of tasks that it can execute. It's a simple picture, I will tell you more details a bit later. Okay, so what is the driver? Driver is the entry point of the Spark shell. It can be Scala, Python, and R. The, one of the main advantages of Spark is that it supports interactive shell uh, languages like Scala, Python, and R. The idea is that when you write MapReduce in Java, you write Java code, compile, deliver it to the cluster, run MapReduce job, collect the logs, see the output, see the error, go back to your code, recompile, and so on. When you run interactive shell, you don't need all of this. You just run the command in interactive shell and immediately get the error message if you got the error, and so on. You can immediately edit it and rerun. And then you can save everything that you have written, all the code, save it to the script file, and then run it as a job. 
So this is one of the big advantages of Spark, and driver is an entry point of the shell application. It is a place where a Spark context is created. Spark context has all the meta information about your cluster, which machines are in the cluster, which are the configuration of each of these virtual machines, how, many, how much memory they have, how much cores dedicated to these machines. It receives all the heartbeats back from the executors to understand that they are still alive. If it doesn't receive a uh, heartbeat from the executor, it considers executor as dead, it updates metadata, bring up another executor on another machine and joins it to the cluster. It translates RDD into execution graph. So when you start execution, when you execute an action, it gets all the metadata about all the RDDs participating in this action and generates you a direct cyclic graph of execution based on the RDD meta information. It splits this execution graph into separate stages of execution. I will show you how it happens. And it schedules the each of the tasks of data processing and controls the execution. It stores all the metadata about RDDs and their partitions, how they stored, where they stored, and what they are. And uh, it gives you also a web user interface. It's another nice feature of uh, Spark. Each application, Spark application that you start on your cluster, gives you a web interface. In this web interface, you can see what was executed on this uh, specific application. What is the current status? What is the memory utilization? What is the status of all the executors? And so on. You're in the latest versions, I think 1.6, you can even see the click of the RDD and see the execution plan in a graphical way. So it's, it's a very, very good tool. And next is executor. Executor stores the data in the cache in the JVM heap, or it can cache the data to the hard disk drive. You have a number of settings to control how you use the cache. Then it reads the data from external sources. So driver itself never reads any data, unless you write the code that will go work around the RDT and read the data directly. You, you can do it, but you can read data directly to the master and then call Spark context parallelize. It will create an RDD on top of this data. Then it writes the data to external sources. When you execute something like save, save as text file, save as sequence file, save as parquet file, then it uh, writes the data back to the hard disk drive, back to HDFS, back to S3 or what file system you will use. And it performs all the data processing, all the tasks, all the, all the processing logic. So the data is never loaded to the master. Here is how it looks like. As you understood, both the driver and the executor are JVM. Each JVM has a set of uh, uh, settings regarding the storage. So JVM heap, imagine that you get a specific heap settings for the JVM. Save fraction is 90% of the heap by default. It means that 90% of all the memory of executor are dedicated for all the data processing tasks. 10% is reserved to avoid out of memory. Then you got 60% of the save dedicated for storage. This is the place where, where your cache will live. If you execute cache and uh, the persistence level will require memory, this is where it will be stored. Storage has a part called unroll. Unroll is the part that is used to deserialize the data. Because in cache you can store just Java objects, but also you can store serialized data. If the data is serialized and compressed, you need some place to transform this serialized data back to Java objects. And this 20% of the storage is used to unroll specific partitions. Partitions are often unrolled one by one. So you store 100 of partitions in the storage, for instance, you get one partition, unroll it, convert to Java objects, and process them. Shuffle part is 20% of the save. In general, <laughs> save can be specified separately for storage and separately for shuffle, but usually they have the same value. This is why I draw it this way. So shuffle is the place where you store the sorted data because you need to have a buffer. This is the storage. And to sort the data and partition the data, you need to have some memory buffer. And this is the amount of memory you can use for storing intermediate sorting data. So that's it. And if you have Python, you use PySpark, then you get a separate Python process running together with the main one, and it has a save of 90%. But in general, no data is stored in Python. When you process something, when you execute a cache in Python, the data will be stored in the JVM storage in a serialized way. 
it will be big of serialization as far as I, I know. So it will be serialized in Python but stored in Java and it will reside there. Okay, here is a more detailed picture about what it is and how it looks like. So we got a client node, we got a driver JVM, inside of it we got a Spark context. Then we got a number of worker nodes. On each of the worker nodes, we can have a number of executors. It's not necessary to have only one. You can have five of them, ten of them. It's completely up to you to set this number. Each executor JVM might execute many tasks in parallel because for each of the executors, you specify the amount of cores it can work with. For each of the tasks, you specify the amount of cores this task requires. And then each executor might run a number of tasks and you might have many of them. For instance, if you're working with Hadoop cluster and you're working with Yarn, with Yarn you have completely no option of controlling where your JVM will be bring up. You just request Yarn that I need 10 containers, each one should have 32 gigabytes of memory. And it returns information where you can bring them up and node managers will bring them up. And uh, you have completely no way to affect it in any way. So this is how the cluster usually look like. And if we add Python to the picture, it will look like this. So Python will run together on the driver JVM and Python will work separately for each of the executor JVMs. With the current implementation, it's even uh, better. Python will work separately for each of the tasks. So here I write one Python for one executor, but it really turned out that with the current implementation, it has one Python process for each of the tasks. On the master, on the client, on the driver, each Python, Python process communicates with the driver using Py4G library. So it really uh, creates a socket to communicate with the Java and it uh, executes commands uh, and passes them to the JVM. And JVM really executes some transformations on the data, executes some actions on top of the RDD. So Python is just like a Python interface for the transformations. On the nodes, the data is transferred through the pipe. So no library is used. Java just uh, get, brings up Python process and puts serialized data into the input stream of this Python process. This is how it works. And the same for getting the data back, so standard input, standard output. So levels of decomposition of uh, Spark application. Application is the biggest part. When you uh, run something like uh, Spark Shell, it brings up an application. When you close a Spark Shell, it brings down the application. When you run in a Hive Thrift server that starts Spark server behind it, and you get a user, your user's JDBC interface to the cluster, this whole cluster is a single application. When it is up, application started. When it is down, application stopped. Each application runs a number of jobs. Each job is complete set of transformations, finishing by action or finishing by save to the external storage. Each job is split into separate stages. Stages are split by the shuffle, by the read part, by the write part on the end, or by the action. And each stage is split into task. Task is a single stage for a single partition. Stage is in general. I will show you an example. Here is the same word count example. We read text file, execute flat map, then map, then we execute reduce by key, and then we execute for each. First stage is all of this. All of this can be executed in a single pass, because you see all the partitions are, can be pipelined. All of these transformations can be pipelined and executed in a single action. Second stage is this one. You see between them we have a shuffle. Another option to split execution stages is to use cache. For instance, if all of these partitions were cached, we will not create the first stage because we just don't need it. We got all the data ready. But if we don't have at least one block of one partition here, then we will create all this stage to get this information. And then we got tasks. Task 1, task 2, task 3, task 4. Everything that can be pipelined for a single partition will be pipelined. And here we got task 5, 6, 7, 8. Here is how it looks like. And in the end, the execution logic itself will be the following. We read data from HDFS, we execute all the transformations in a single task, and we 
generate partitions, one partition for each of the output files. We transfer it to the, usually we call them mappers and reducers, because it's very similar to the map reduce. So mappers transfer data to the reducers. And reducers, again, pipeline and execute the final transformation. How you can persist the data? You can persist the data only in memory. This way it will be least recently used cache. If you don't have enough memory, you, you, got, uh, you want to save new partition, old partition will be evicted and it will be just removed from the memory. If later you will need this partition, it will go through the RDD dependencies graph and find how to recompute it. Memory and disk if you got a cache eviction from memory, the data will be stored to the hard disk drive. It will not be completely evicted. Usually the best practice is to use memory and disk for the shuffle results, not to, re not to recompute the whole shuffles. Then memory only serialized, again it stores data in memory but in a serialized way. Memory and disk serialized, the same, stores the data in memory. If the cache eviction happens for memory, it evicts data on the hard disk drive and store it in a serialized way. You can also have disk only. How... Um, yeah, we'll tell about this a bit later. Okay, so persistence is Spark. Spark uh, considers uh, memory as a cache which is least recently used. So its the logic is very simple. If you use this uh, specific partition, it gets, uh, it gets on top of the list. When you need more uh, space to put another partition into your cache, and you see that cache is full, you just get the least recently used one and remove it. Check whether space is enough, get, again remove the last one, unless you get enough space to fit this specific partition you need. If disk is involved, data is involved to the disk. Uh, if any, any one of you knows Spark, uh, do you know why use count after the cache? Yes, because count is an action. If you execute just cache, it will just update the metadata. It, sta it will state that these partitions should be cached, but they will not be cached unless you execute something involving computations of these partitions. So again, it's just the metadata. I've, told, I've shown you the list of uh, metadata stored for each of the partitions, each of RDDs. Cache will just mark that this partition should be cached. The, while this partition is not yet executed, not yet materialized, you will not cache anything because you cannot do it. Cache does not cause any actions. When you execute count, you will see this specific RDD in the list of your cached items in the web user interface of Spark. And then you call RDD persist, you can use specific level of persistence. Spark has a number of built-in levels, but it's completely up to you to specify any other persistence level. You can specify how many copies you want to store in memory, how many copies to store on disk, how many copies to store in a serialized way, in a not serialized way, because for redundancy you might store two copies of the data in memory. This way when one of your executors will fail, you will still have a copy of data in memory. This is for faster processing. And unpersist causes all the data to be removed from the cache. Next is uh, Spark Shuffle. So, Shuffle is a very important concept in Spark. Prior to Spark 1.0, Shuffle was one of the main problems in Spark because it was uh, implemented in not very um, scalable way. It was implemented as a, just a simple hash shuffle. Initially, Spark was developed at the University of Berkeley. It was developed as a uh, project of uh, people working on the master degrees, as far as I know, and the professors. And uh, it was an completely academic stuff. And then they released Apache Spark to the open source, they released it to Apache Foundation, and it took them more than a year to understand the problem of uh, Shuffle and Spark. If you will Google, you will find many publications on the problems and how to solve them, um, different options, research papers, and so on. For instance, Yahoo had a very big problem that uh, hash shuffle generated them uh, more than a million files on each of the nodes. And then, you know that uh, Linux file systems are not infinite in terms of performance. If you want to generate one million files and then you want to remove one million files, you will have very big problems and uh, because it will take much time. Your file system will be just freezing while you're removing these million files. And it's not the best for, for big jobs, for big clusters. 
but it works pretty well if you have 10 nodes, 15 nodes. So if you have academic cluster, it works very well and you will not find any problems in this. But when you go with this to into production on a big cluster, you will suffer much. Next, implementation is a sword shuffle. It is default now. It's implemented in a very similar way it is implemented in uh, Hadoop. And the last one is a tungsten short, sword. Is, uh, as you might know, Project Tungsten is a project that uh, is initiated by Databricks, who mainly maintains Spark now. And the idea is to make Spark uh, very, very fast, at least three times or five times faster. Okay, so now I will tell you how it works. But before this, I want to understand, I want you all to understand that when you run Spark, Spark is not in memory processing tool. Spark puts data to hard disk drives in many different ways. As I already shown you, if you call persist and you choose persistence level of disk, the data will be written to the hard disk drive. When you run the shuffle, each of these shuffles put the data to the hard disk drives. So each time you run shuffle, you get the data to the hard disk drive, and then you read it on the target system. So Spark is not really in memory thing, but it's very fast because of the pipeline and caching capabilities. Okay, hash shuffle, what it is and how it works. Imagine that you got executor JVM and a big number of partitions stored in a cache. These partitions might be stored in memory in cache, but you also might have some partitions on the hard disk drive in a cache. You start to execute map tasks. For each of the nodes, you see that you got the setting Spark Executor cores. This is the amount of cores that can be managed by a specific executor. And you got Spark task CPUs. This is the amount of CPUs each task can, uh, can use on this specific executor. If you divide them, then you will have a number of execution slots, something like this, on each of the executors. By default, Spark task CPUs equal to 1. So when you set executor cores to 10, you get 10 executor slots. Set it to 15, you get 15 parallel tasks running. I call them map tasks because it is very familiar to the map reduce. In general, it's just tasks. Each task will partition the data and output a single output file for each of the partitions. Number of files is a number of reducers. Number of reducers is basically a number of partitions in a target uh, RDD. Second one will output the same. A big number of files, one file for each of the reducers. So the total number of groups will equal to the total number of tasks executed on this JVM. As you might understand, you might have an RDD with 1000 partitions and you got only two JVMs. It means that each of them will execute approximately 500 tasks. For 500 tasks, you will have 500 groups of n, uh, n partitions, and n will be equal to the amount of partitions on the target side. So the amount of files created is very, very huge, and you cannot avoid their creation and their removal after this. This is why the first optimization they made was to make a consolidation. So how sh shuffle with consolidation works? You got the same JVM with the partitions. You start the first mapper task and output it outputs something to the output files. But it does not, I've shown you that it just writes some data. Then we start the second map and it writes another. It creates another files and writes some data into these files. But then first finish and the second starts and it writes to the same files. This way, the number of groups is limited by the parallelism for a specific uh, executor JVM. So in my example, with 1000 partitions and only two JVMs, if you can execute 10 parallel tasks by each, you will have 10 groups of files created. So it's much better than creating 500 group of files. So this way it works fast. Then the second finishes and the second writes something. And this way you get a limited number of groups. It helps only in some scenarios when amount of reducers is not very big and when concurrency is not very big, when your cluster is not very big. But then they implemented sword shuffle. Sword shuffle is much better than this. So again, the question to the audience. Uh, if you know, Spark has many places where it uses sort. Which sort and algorithm is used inside of Spark? Okay, it's team sort. Team sort is a very nice implementation. If you cannot sort, 
heard anything about team sort, you should read it because it's it's very impressive. Okay, so executor JVM, you get a number of partitions stored in memory. Uh, I've shown that it is uh, Spark storage safety fraction multiplied by memory fraction. Then you get a number of parallel map tasks executed. Each of the map tasks uh, uses append only map, and this is where you use uh, memory fraction for the shuffle. This is what I showed you on the slide how Spark utilizes the memory. Here is where you really need it. It uses append only map. This append only map is executed as an uh, open hashing map. They get their own implementation of the open hashing. They use Marmor hash for this and uh, you can read it. It's, it's a nice piece of code. It's, it's not very big. It's something like 200 lines in Scala, but it's, it's very nice. Then, on top of the append only map, they execute sort and spill and spill the data to the file system. It gets an index and get a single output file. Index is used for you to be able to receive a specific partition out of this file. So, as you have seen in the previous hash, uh, hash partition, uh, hash, sh hash shuffle, it creates a single file for single partition. Here it creates a single file for each of the spills, and this file is indexed. This way you don't need to create 1000 files if you have got 1000 partitions. It will be just two files, output and index. It works in a similar way in MapReduce when the final output of the mapper is uh, sorted. Uh, output file with an index. Index is usually stored in memory, it's not created as a separate file. Okay. Next, you get separate append only map. They're running in parallel, as you might remember, and it generates additional output files. And the next one, because spilling might happen many times, so you get chunks of the data, and this way you get a number of output files. And then you get a, a merge of all these files using MinHip and feed it to the reduced tasks. This is how sort shuffle works. So the amount of files created is much, much smaller because it really depends on how much memory you have. If you want to reduce the amount of files created, you can re increase the amount of memory dedicated for the shuffle. Or you can reduce the parallelism. And the last one, and the most interesting one, is a tungsten sort. Tungsten sort is uh, an optimization done in the recent, I think, uh, three to four months and uh, it's now available in Spark 1.5, 1.5.1, 1, 1.5.2. Okay, so you get a number of partitions stored in memory. For each of them you are executing map tasks. Map task writes the data to the memory, but compared to the sort shuffle, it writes the data in a serialized way and separately stores uh, pointers to each of the serialized items. Inside of it, it is using Java unsafe to copy the serialized data from one location to another to avoid garbage collection. Then it sort and spill just in a similar way and create the output file that gets all the partitions. As you might understand, the limitation of this implementation is that these pointers store only partition ID and uh, a list of uh, pointers to specific data entries. The problem is that it sorts only by partition ID. It, does, it cannot sort by a specific field. So if you want not only partition, but partition and sort at the same time, with sort shuffle you can do it. With tungsten sort, no, you have to sort on the reducer side. Then you get a second spill, it creates a second output file. Then you get a new map task started, it creates again array of data pointers and serialized data. Sort and spill and spill the data. The idea of this is that you don't need to deserialize the data to process it. If your data is already cached in a serialized way, you just get this data and copy it to the buffer with unsafe. You don't need to deserialize, you don't need to do anything. And then when you spill the data, again you take the same block of data serialized and write it to hard disk drive. With sort shuffle, you always have to deserialize it before putting to the append on the map and serialize it back when put into the hard disk drive. It's a big overhead. So this thing allows you to avoid this overhead. Also, array of data pointers implemented the way that it is well aligned on a processor cache line, so it's, uh, it's working very fast.
and then after this you are merging all of these files but it is very simple because these are just the files of partitions with index you merge all the partitions together and this way you get a single output file with a single index and then this single output file it's very similar to the MapReduce because you've got a single output file it is fed to the reducers and the last part that I wanted to talk is about the Spark data frame the idea of the data frame is to create a single interface for all the languages to use to avoid copying the data back to a specific, for instance, to copy data to Python and copying it back. To use it as completely an interface, not as it used as it used now. So, for instance, when you are running some code in Python, you are creating a lambda function. You have seen this example in word count. This lambda function is executed on the Python side. This way, you have to copy all the data from Java to Python, deserialize it, execute something in Python, serialize it, and copy it back to Java. This is a big circle. With the data frame, everything you are doing is manipulating with the interface. It got a big number of built-in functions like minimum, maximum, average, uh, correlation of the values and so on. So many it looks very familiar to the SQL interface, but it's uh, a bit different. If you worked with data frames, for instance in Python, in Pandas data frames, they are very, very similar. And this way, if it is a single interface, it can use the different options to execute these, uh, these uh, transformations. So it can potentially use GPU, it can use NVRAM, but again it can use traditional JVM. This is, uh, with the light blue, you can see everything that already exists, but these are the ways they want to improve it. So for instance, uh, allow for the scientific computations to use uh, video cards, and their processors to process the data in many, many uh, parallel threads. First of all, data frame is an interface. It is an RDD with a schema. So schema, and by schema I mean that it has field names, it got uh, field formats, how they stored, and uh, so on. Also it has some statistics. It is unified transformation interface and uh, anytime data frame under, under it has an RDD. So data frame is abstraction built on top of RDD. Anytime you want, you can access the RDD under this data frame. It will be translated to the RDD. It's very useful. And what is inside of the data frame? So first of all, internally it's the same RDD, but it's not really the same. Data is really stored in a row columnar format. It means that it gets you a better compression when you, when you cache it, when you evict it to the hard disk drive. Also for each of the columns, for each of the small parts, of, for each of block, it's not block, it's batch size, for each batch, it's a number of uh, sequential rows of your data, you store min-max values for each of the columns. This way, when you process this data, uh, for instance, filter it in a specific way, you can avoid deserializing the data because you store these statistics. It's something like a zone map in databases. And it allows better compression, as I told you. If you know, if you got a row oriented data, the typical compression radio for this is something like 2, 2.5x. You, most, for most of the data types, you won't get better. For columnar data, the compression ratios are six times, seven times, sometimes it's eight times, but it's very rare cases. And it delivers you much faster performance for small subsets of columns. Again, it stores in a columnar way. If you need only two columns out of 100, then you don't need to deserialize the data for 100 columns. You deserialize only these two specific columns. This is why data frames are fast, and uh, in general, Databricks sees data frames as the future for Apache Spark, but I'm not completely aligned because I think that RDD has much more functionality. It gives you much more flexibility because data frames has only some hard-coded, some implemented uh, actions that you can execute on top of them, and it's very familiar to the SQL interface. It's like SQL interface for analysts, but RDD is an interface for programmers too work with the data. So that's it. Do you have any questions, any comments? Uh, do, do you have a microphone? Oh. Mm -hmm.
Okay, you can ask me directly and I will... Uh, Uh, okay, when it is better to use MapReduce and not use Spark? In general, it's a tough question. MapReduce, I, from my opinion, MapReduce at the moment is more stable than Spark. And if you have something already implemented in MapReduce, you can live with this. But if you're thinking about implementing something new, Spark can dramatically reduce the time to implement it. Because with MapReduce, you can do almost anything you can, and anything you like. With Spark, it's completely the same. Spark has the same map and same reduce. You can execute the same MapReduce with it. This is basically how first implementation of Spark SQL was made. It was called Shark. They have taken Hive execution engine that translates everything to MapReduce and used only two functions of Spark, map and reduce uh, underneath. But finally, they found out that with Spark SQL and its optimizations, they can do it three to five times faster. So you can use Spark as the same map reduce if you want. It will not cause you a paradigm change, but with Spark you will have a dramatically reduced uh, development time. Second is for business uh, analysts. So this Spark has ML Lib. ML Lib is uh, widely adopted through the people working with data, building machine learning algorithms. You will not make these people run MapReduce code, write MapReduce code. It's very complex for them. For them, it's easier to get a sample of the data, calculate their machine learning models, and then deliver them to developers to develop Java code in MapReduce. So this dramatically decreases all this complexity. So this is what I think. Okay, do you have any other questions? Yeah. So yeah. uh, we have. Uh, I want to clarify something. Uh, if we want to use uh, Python, for example, uh, we have uh, a, an interface, and yeah. uh, we shouldn't send data uh, to the Python. Uh, yes. We only say uh, how to do uh, some methods uh, on our JVM with our data. Yes. 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 So you are not transferring the data. You execute, and for instance, you are telling it that. Spark data frame is just a, you can think of this as a table. It has column names, it has column types, and so on. And you're saying that you want to group by this field, calculate average over this field, get a window function working over these fields, and so on. All of this is getting tr transferred to all of this meta information, transferred to the JVM. JVM uses uh, uh, query optimizer to build the execution plan, just like the database. So in general, manipulating data frame and writing SQL queries in Spark SQL is the same way. They're transferring to the same interface and same query optimizer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexei. Thank you.